I see it is you've got two choices. You can either keep pretending like nothing bad's ever gonna happen to you, and then when it does, you're saying, uh-oh, or you can get ahead of what's coming so that when it does, not if, you're ready for it, and you're sitting pretty, sipping on Mai Tais next to the pool, working on that Caribbean suntan, because you got it covered. So folks, it's time for you to learn the truth about money. It's time for you to take back control of your money so that you are ready for what's about to happen. By doing that, you're setting yourself up for absolute success. No matter what comes your way, you're ready for it. And that's what I want for you, and I wanna help you with that. So go to chrisnoggle.com and sign up for the Wealth Webinar. We do them every Wednesday at 1 p.m., and you need to be there because it's time for over 90 years, we've been crash testing our cars in the tireless pursuit of automotive safety. At Volvo, safety's been first since 1927. We've saved millions of lives with the invention of the three-point seatbelt in 1959. At Volvo, we've made driving safer for you and them. Visit safety.finlayvolvo.com to learn more. So they say if you give a man a gun, he'll rob a bank. But if you give a man a bank, he'll rob everybody. The good news for you is Private Money Club runs solely on peer-to-peer -peer relationships, which means no banks allowed. So finally, there's a community for real estate entrepreneurs where it is truly a win-win solution. This community is a place where you can connect with other lenders and other borrowers, and the end results, massive growth for you. You get to build your real estate empire, and you get to do it solving other people's problems. So if that sounds like a place you want to be, well then join us. Go to privatemoneyclub.com forward slash Kelly. And if you want 500 bucks off, just add the code Kelly500 and I'll knock 500 bucks off the premier membership. We'll see you on the inside. Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas podcast where attitude is everything on today's show. I hope you're not watching because this guy is too handsome. Uh, I hope my wife doesn't watch this episode either um, because honestly, he's making me look bad. I asked him to knock out one of it, at least one of his teeth. Um, so my wife wouldn't uh, understand what's possible in life. Um, it, it, this, this man has inspired me through my friends. Um, I, have, I have a tech strain, and for those of you who know me personally, um, you know that I've had uh, my same friends since I was in fourth grade. Um, I, I have best friends in Will and Andy and uh, in Alfred and my brother Rob and Dave, and we have this tech strain, and we go back and forth, and I keep seeing this guy's stuff pop up. Like, I see his books, his quotes all over the place, then my brother will post it, and I'm back and forth. I'm like, hey, uh, this, this guy is incredible. The, the cool thing is, then I reach out, and he's a, as accessible and personable as you can even imagine, especially a person on his level, a best-selling author, a world-renowned speaker, going all over the world, having multiple books. Um, I want you to stop right now, and I want you to go to Instagram. And if you go to Instagram, it's uh, Michael Ivanoff, um, at Michael Ivanoff. You have to check out his book, the, uh, the newest one, The Cabin at the End of the Train. Um, he's got the, the Mount of Olives. He's got The Traveler's Secret, and he's got The Servant with One Talent, and then he's got Extraordinary Life Journal. So I want you to, uh, honestly, like, I generally don't tell you to stop because I want you to stay here. I want you to subscribe, and I want you to make me look cool in front of my kids. But I need you to stop. Put us on pause and go and check this man out because it's incredible what he's being able to do. And the, the, the other cool thing for me is that he is working with his wife right now and they're working together to be able to build a future. So it is my honor, my pleasure, and all my friends think I'm cool now because I'm your friend, but <laughs> please welcome to the show, Mr. Michael Ivanoff. That's a heck of an introduction. Thank you so much, Kelly. It's an honor. <laughs> Appreciate it, it's an it's an honor to be able to have you, man. I mean, I, I started to hear the accent a little bit, and and also too, like when when you see someone in your position speaking all over the world, inspiring people, speaking life into people, you always think like, oh man, this guy has got it good. He's always had it good, and mm -hmm. therefore, I almost you know sometimes people will tune out because they'll be like, well, if my life was that good and I could work with my wife and travel all over the world, but that's not the case here, Michael. Can you take us into some of the backstory and what helped you to want to speak life into the rest of the world? Yeah, so for me, the going back to um, going back to uh, a job that I was working at where 
um, it kind of put me in a state of depression. For me, it was that when I left, uh, when I was, when it's time for me to graduate college or graduate high school, um, my dad was like, Hey, you, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to go to college. You're going to go into business. Like some of your older brothers, what do you, you know, what, you make a decision, you know, don't, don't drag your feet too long. And my, my dad was always pushing us in a good way. And, um, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. And so I just kind of picked a career out of a hat. I was like, I'll go do, I'll work with computers. Cause that sounds like a safe, smart thing to do. And I started working for this company where um, I was in their IT department, but it was a, it was a very small printing company. And it wasn't that it was a bad company. It wasn't that it was a, um, it was just, it, it forced me to realize that, Hey, like I have a lot more to offer than to sit here and kind of, write these little basic code, you know, for this little printing company, because it, it wasn't fulfilling. I, I felt like I had, you know, like I was somebody that had a lot of humor, like I like to joke around, I felt like I had, um, I was creative in, in different aspects of my life. And I wasn't utilizing any of that. And, and it, it actually felt like it was suppressing it. Um, you know, because then I just kind of got into this mindset of, you know, counting down the days, I'd come into work on Monday, I'm counting down the days till Friday, that kind of a thing. Sunday, Sunday evening comes around and you got, you got the Sunday night blues, you know, because, you know, you're going to work the next day. And so it really forced me to start thinking about my life. Like, okay, if this is not what I want to do forever, then what is it? And I don't want to just go try a different job because, you know, oftentimes when people are fed up with something, they just move on to the next thing. But the next thing is just, it's only a matter of time till they're going to be tired there as well. And so I was like, okay, if I'm going to step away from this, if I'm going to change course in life, that it, it better be something that I can, like put all of myself into. And so I was, you know, I, I, I kind of was, was taking my time. And at that time we actually got, uh, my brothers and I got invited into a, a multi-level marketing company, <laughs> <laughs> which it, 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 it hey, was, the, the, the reason why I laugh is not laughing at your pain, but for those who have heard <laughs> me speak about this before, you know, my pop, my pops, Michael, had, we, we got involved with this early on in fourth grade and it, it was a, it was a, a foundational thing, but talk about that multi-level marketing, because I think these things need to be exposed more and more. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, whether the legitimacy of the company, you know, I'm not going to speak to that, but <laughs> um, it seemed like there were successful people in it, um, <laughs> but it was, it didn't work out for us at all. I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, you had to be like, you had to be a salesman and like, I just didn't have any sales skills. I had no idea what I was doing. And uh, I think you, we were selling, um, what, like, what was uh, the promise? What, what was the promise that you saw? Because this, the reason why I want to say this is because I want to talk about this for a second, because a lot of times no one talks about it until the end. And then most of the people who go through it don't talk about it because they're kind of embarrassed. Like, Oh, I got kind of mm -hmm. duped a little bit, but sure. a person who's never been exposed to it, what are some of the things that they can look out for that they know that like it, it, that, that could be some red flags to stop yeah. them from going down that road? Uh, biggest red flag is that you're going to make a, a, a ton of money, a crap ton of money in your first month. <laughs> if somebody tells you that, <laughs> walk away right away. So that was, that's what drew, drew us in. It's like, oh man, we're going to, you know, they said within a couple of months, we're going to get all this residual income. All we have to do is invite friends and family to sign up for these services. Then we're going to start getting bonuses. And we were in, in our group of friends, you know, we were pretty influential, influential. So we're like, all right, this is going to be e easy for us, you know? And so it was like the promise of, you know, quick money, the promise of re residual income. And it was all, all these things that ended up like, none of it was working out. It ended up, you know, it was, it was real work and it was hard work. And I was like, all right, if I'm going to work this hard on something, I'm going to at least do it, put, put all this effort into like my own product or my own company or something. Um, the good thing that I took out of it was when we'd go to conferences, they would heavily push uh, personal development. So read books, you know, they brought in motivational speakers. And that's what I took from that, that it was, it was actually in that process that I discovered a book by Ogmandino. And when I read one of his books, I, I was like, it was like, like, it was like a breath of fresh air. It was just like, wow, like, okay, I do have something bigger to offer. I can do something greater with my life. And it was just like that. It allowed me to believe that like, all right, there is more out there. I don't have to just go do construction like some of my brothers or friends or, or go work with cars like a lot of Russian people do. And it was, at least at that time it was. And I was like, I want to do something unique. I want to blaze my own trail. And it was reading that book because of the personal development that the, you know, the MLM pushed. Um, that's what really got me 
actually believing that I could do something unique and something different with my life. And because Augmentino was an author and a motivational speaker, I'm like, well, what if I just go do that? Like, what if I try that? What if I, you know, if I can speak, I can get up onto a stage or I could write a book and some kid, because when I read Augmentino's book, he, he had already passed away years ago. And so I was like, okay, if I can get up onto a stage and there's a, you know, there's some video footage of me or some kid picks up my book, you know, I'm long gone. Like, you know, I've passed away. I'm an old man or I've passed away and they read it and it inspires them and it gets them to believe in their abilities and, and, and forces them to think about their gifts and talents. Then that's a life of purpose. I was like, that would be something that I could really pursue. And so that was after that, it, it was kind of like a switch that flipped. And I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do it. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to go try this thing and, and I'm going to work towards it. So how, what was the first stage? Like when you're, cause you weren't an author before that. Um, mm -hmm. so what's the first stage? Cause there are a lot of people and and I'm sure you've heard this every time, uh, all my friends who are authors and, uh, you know, I've been very fortunate to have, uh, we've got another book coming out soon. And, but every time I have a conversation with someone, they're like, Oh yeah, I'm writing a book too. And I'm like, cool. And they're like, well, I haven't, I haven't written any words, but I have all the thoughts. And I'm like, so you hadn't written a book. They're like, no, 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 I've written a book, but I just haven't typed it out, published it, or done anything with it. Do you get this conversation yeah. from people all the time too? Uh, all the time, yeah. Um, and and the, the, the funny thing is a lot of people would be like, hey, I got this book idea. It's going to be a bestseller. Should I go get it copyrighted? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I promise you, there's at least a thousand other people that probably have the same idea. No, you shouldn't go get it copyrighted before you even type up a page. Here's some advice, you know, sit down and put the title down on paper and start hammering away, and we'll see where you're at, you know, a couple weeks from now or a couple months from now. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a process, and it it is definitely like it, it seems like it, it is something that people want to do because we we all want to share our thoughts, we want to share you know, our perspective. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the only way to get it done is just sit down and, and, and do that boring hard work that, that it takes. What's the first stage for, a, for an aspiring author out there? Um, it, it, do you do the title first? Do you start writing first? Do you write it in, in pencil? Do you start typing? What do you do, Michael? I, I type. So, so, so far, my first four books have all been in story form. So they're personal development books in story form. Um, I'm working on a new book right now. That one's actually going to be a nonfiction. So this one, I actually kind of sat down and structured it out. Like I want a chapter on this topic. I want a chapter on this. And then I kind of am placing it where I think it should go best. But when I was doing my first four, I kind of, for each book, I had this, I would just have like one snapshot image in my head that I really wanted. And, it, and I'd create the book around it. So for example, my, uh, for the traveler secret, it's, it's this vagabond and this is like ancient Gaul times and he, he's miserable. He's walking through the snow. It's just that something about that setting. And he finds this pub in this little village and he kind of goes in there just to stay warm. And he sits down, he steals some beer from, from this drunk guy that's passed out on a table and he's kind of huddled around by the fire drinking his beer. And then this strange, you know, traveler comes in and kind of starts prying at him and asking him like, well, you know, why are you here? What, you know, what do you think led you to get to this point in your life? And he's kind of has all these excuses, but it was just like that one little scene that like, that like popped into my head and I kind of created the book out of that. So that like, that's kind of how I start the book is from that scene. And then the story kind of built into it. So, so, I, so most of the time what I find uh, Michael is there's a lot of people that have inspirations like that, that there's a bit of truth to it, or maybe they've seen it before. Is this true in your inspirations? As far as where, where I get my ideas from? Yeah, like, like I right? mean, because a lot of times you hear the backstories of stuff, right? And it's mm -hmm. like, we think, we see you, we see this grandiose, best-selling author, one of the top speakers in the world, and we're like, oh my gosh, it's divine inspiration. And then I talk to a lot of people, and they're like, no, I was actually at a pub, I saw a drunk dude, and he was, you know, doing this, and it caused me, or my uncle told me this story when I was a kid, and that's what mm -hmm. jumped it off. Was it that kind, or is it just divine uh, inspiration for you? No, no, it's, it's that kind. I, I always appreciate good, deep conversations. Some of my best conversations that I have with my friends, with my brothers is sitting around a fire. And, and th that's when everyone's willing to open up a little bit and go a little bit deeper. And, you know, you have a couple of beers and all of a sudden <laughs> you, your walls come down and you're 
more vulnerable. And it was like, it was that, that's what kind of inspired that book in particular. But as far as the character from my first book to my, my, my most recent book, I always feel like I'm, I take my own frustrations, my own struggles w between my faith, between the entrepreneurial journey, between the, the self doubt, the insecurities, and I kind of put them into this character. And I always have a mentor character in the book as well. And the mentor character you know, usually be, you know, whether it's parts of my dad and the way he, he talked to me or, uh, you know, my faith in God. And, and it's like, what, what would be that conversation? If like, if I could sit down, I could have a conversation with God, for example, like, what would he tell me? I'm talking about my insecurities. I got all these doubts. Like, what would he say? And so it starts to develop this really cool dialogue that I, I'm, it's still me writing it, but like, it's almost like I get to answer my own questions. And so it's like, I, it's very therapeutic because I get to kind of pour out all my pain and the frustrations and insecurities. But at the same time, there's truths and things that I learned in life. And I have to remind myself of that. And I get to do that through that kind of, uh, through that character. So. So we just had an experience this morning, right? We have t uh, Tuesday morning, um, every morning in Carlsbad, on, or every Tuesday on Car uh, in Carlsbad at 7.30. It's completely open invitation to anybody. But we have a men's group. And one of the guys, um, he found out that his daughter had been diagnosed with cancer. And yeah. she is not even a year old. And he came in. He stopped by because he's on the way to the hospital today because his daughter that's not one years old is starting chemotherapy today. Hmm. It rocked all of us because we all had prayer requests. We all had this stuff. And then we all look at each other and we're like, nothing really matters. Like out, I mean, in comparison here, and we, you know, you don't compare, but you know, yeah. we don't need any selfish prayer. We need to pray for this guy. And then the question yeah, yeah, was, well, the question was asked of one of my, one of my friends that's in the group. I said, hmm. cause, cause you could see he was shook. And he was kind of mad. And in those kind of times, frustration, a lot of times we don't voice our frustration with God because we, you know, we're, we're taught like, oh, we've got a reverence and all this stuff. But my pop taught me one time, he came out the, the garage and he comes down and I could tell that he was kind of fired up. I said, what, what'd you do, dad? He's like, I was up in the attic yelling at God. And I was like, well, you better watch out. Like, don't get next to me because you're about to get struck by lightning. But he said, it's okay. And God wants you to yell at him because he wants to have a real relationship with you. And mm -hmm. so I asked my friend today that his best friend is the, is the dad of this little girl. I said, if God was sitting on the couch right now, unfiltered, what would you ask him? Mm -hmm. So that's my question to you, Michael, like with the struggles, with the struggles with your faith, if God was sitting in this room with us right now, What's the unfiltered, not the, you know, hey, I need to sell a book or I want you to hire me to speak or whatever, because everyone's going to do it anyway. But course, I'm talking yeah. the unfiltered, like, yell at God. What would that question be? How come you don't show yourself as often or when I need you? Mm. Yeah. Like when I, when, I'm, when I really need you, when my friends really need you. When people really need you, how come you can't just be there? You know, we're supposed to blindly follow and we're, we're, we're taught that, you know, you love us so much and you're, you're right there. You're all, you're with us in our struggles. And, but it's like, you know, I wish that you could just show your face sometimes a little bit more. That's, that's what I'd ask. What do you think the mentor in the, uh, in the, uh, the traveler would have answered to the, the guy who, you know, was drink, drinking, uh, stole the beer, sitting in the pub. What do you think the mentor would have answered? Wow, these are <laughs> good questions, Kelly. Um, get your face out of the mug. I'm, I'm, I'm right there. Put your distractions away. You're, you're looking everywhere, but where you need to be looking. You're, you're filling your time with, and going to me personally with social media, with your own pursuit of your dreams, with all these things that have filled your head and, and I'm right here. You just gotta find us, find, give me some space to speak. Like give me some silence to speak and then, and then you will hear me. Wow. 
So I've been very fortunate to be in the personal development uh, world and around it since I was in fourth grade. My dad brought me into it, uh, raised me on, um, raised me and my brother on Og Mandino, on uh, Ken Blanchard, um, you name it in that world. I didn't know who they were. My dad would just say the sayings all the time. Now I get the opportunity, um, you know, being around some of my friends. uh, Greg Reed is a very good friend of mine, one of the top in the uh, personal development realm. And... um, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be the, the co-host of Secret Knock, which is the number one networking uh, conference in the world that you can't go to unless you're invited. Um, <laughs> you know, but how, how do you toe the line of the personal development and faith? Because a lot of times people skew it and they turn the personal development into, I'm the guru, come worship me, do mm-hmm. all my principles, but you have turned it in a completely different way. You, you almost give, I, I've watched you, like you give audiences the ability to be able to almost lift themselves up and you take the shine off of you. How, how, how have you been able to perfect that art? Uh, I steal biblical principles <laughs> and I kind of point, I, I, um, I kind of point them into, I, so like I speak in schools, I speak in corporate events, you know, like you can't, you can't always, some are totally fine with it, but you can't always, usually, especially if it's in a school, like you can't, they don't want you to share your faith. You know, they, they want to, you know, and so it's like, but I'll still, I'll share different biblical principles. I, sh- I always talk about the parable of the talents and I share it in a kind of like, there's this businessman in ancient Babylon times and he has these three servants that are working for him. And I kind of share that story um, and I plant seeds and I, it, and, and, because everyone know, you know, everyone, if even if it's a high school student, if they really start thinking like, well, if I'm one of the servants, who's the who's the who's the big boss or who's the big businessman that's going to come and ask me about what I've done with my time and my talents. And so I get to kind of like plant seeds that, hey, like I'm talking about taking action. I'm talking about finding your gifts and skills and talents and abilities and digging them out, bringing them to the world, not burying them. I'm talking about taking responsibility for your life, your attitude, the way you carry yourself. But is, and those are all things you're in control of, but there's even something bigger that there's even a bigger purpose to your life. And, and if you go find that, you oftentimes will find the one who planted it there as well. So that's the way I try to do it. The thing that my, my brother and I were talking about this in the personal development industry, um, a lot of times you see destruction of marriage. And when I say this, like if you watch, um, and we've studied this for years, like not studied it for years, we've just been aware of it. And I watch it. And I'll hear this conversation all the time. Like I got into the personal development. I started to see what was possible. Mm. But, my, but my wife or my husband, they ain't personally developing too. So you know what I got to do? I got to keep personally developing. And if they aren't willing to come along, then I just need to get rid of them and find someone yeah, else. And I'm like, oh my goodness, help me with this because I notice this all the time. How do you, what, what things do you put in your life, Michael, to make sure that when the light comes on Michael, that it doesn't just become about Michael and, you know, your wife gets left behind? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, well, like ever since we, since my, since even before we got married, like we, we always shared the vision together, like, because my wife was in, in a similar place that I was too. She didn't, she started going to college. She ended up not, she finished a couple of quarters. So we were both kind of like these two kids that had, you know, no idea how we were going to make, you know, how we were going to succeed in our marriage and in, in life in general. And so um, I was lucky with that. I started planting seeds like, Hey, like, what, what if we did this? What if I could sell books and I could, and I can go speak like, this is a business that both of us can work in. Like if you help me, cause she's very like, she got all the numbers. She does all the finances. Like she, she's, she got it down to every penny. She, she loves being very thorough. And so, and I was like, that's what I need in the, in the business side of it, as far as, you know, reaching out to people, making connections with uh, event planners, that kind of a thing. And I feel like we kind of, I sold her on the dream and and she's been the biggest supporter ever since and in in the process of us working on our dream and on our business and working with our finances you know she has her own hobbies now she's getting heavily into um homesteading and she wants a cow which we have no room for <laughs> in our yard but um i think i think if you if you 
can sell the sell the vision to your spouse and not just hey because this is for me and my ego but this is like hey we can build this life together which is going to give you freedom it's going to give me time freedom to spend with our families to pursue our own little passions to pursue pursue our own little things um then then you can both work together on it but if yeah if it is that thing where it's just like hey i'm i'm growing i'm improving you clearly are not interested in it so you must be the wrong person um yeah that's that's where i think we, you start having problems how about if you um, were talking how about if you were talking to your audience and you're talking to the audience because this is a place where i want to be super mindful being in this space and, yeah. and, you know, like say for instance, we just got a chance to, uh, I just got a chance to MC and then speak at the uh, financial freedom summit uh, for veterans in, um, uh, in Las Vegas. And a lot of spouses weren't in the room and I've got to be, I, I've always been very conscious of, you know, obviously I want every single person to develop and to develop in those things. My, my pop was really big on it. Um, but how do you stay uh, conscious of your audience when you are helping them to develop, but a lot of times the spouse isn't there? Are you, are you adding that in or is that even a thought process for you? Um, it, I guess it kind of depends. What, like, what, if I'm speaking to educators, I was speaking to a, co uh, a room full of educators, like teachers getting ready for their new year. I was, I was speaking to them about personal growth and, and taking responsibility of their mindset and taking control of their mindset, not letting the world and the stress and everything get to them. And at the same time, I was showing them how if they can take control, if they can take responsibility of where they're at and they, and they have something to fight for, they wake up and they have a vision and they're, they're, there's, a, there's a purpose to their life and they know what that is and they're moving towards that it's going to inevitably affect their students. It's going to inevitably affect their households. The, the, you know, anyone that comes in contact with them, you know, it's like, it's like, you can't, you can't pour out of an empty cup. And so it's like, if you know what you're fighting for, you know why, and you, you have strong convictions in it, you're inevitably going to impact people uh, around you. Um, in the sense of, you know, with spouses, I would say this the same thing. Like if you're, if you're, you're, if my wife sees that I'm just speaking, because it's for my own ego, just to, you know, just to feel good about myself, just to get an applause, at, you know, afterwards, and that's it, then I think, you know, that's where I can, you know, our, I can kind of lose, or she might lose a vision for it, but we both have the heart for impacting people, and we see, um, you know, we see breakthrough in people, and we see the, how much people are struggling right now, and so I feel like it's, even though I'm the one speaking uh, and writing, she's building the, the business side of it, but the mission is the same, is the same we're headed in the same direction. So how I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, but. it does. I mean, how have you been able to navigate too? Because you have, you're, are you first generation from, from Russia? Yep. Yeah. So okay. I was born, born in Kiev, Ukraine. Yeah. Okay. And when I was so, two. so how have you been able to navigate? Because with, with your pop, right? So with your pop coming over the mentality, if I'm wrong, stop me. But the mentality in the culture is I put my family above everything I'm willing to sacrifice even my own joy, happiness, whatever it is, because I got to make sure and provide for my family. Am I correct? Am I, am I describing your I, dad right now? I, absolutely. To the T, both of my parents. Yeah. Okay. So then you come into this country where all you hear is you've got to do you. You've got to focus <laughs> on you. You've got to fill you up and then fill up all yeah. the rest of the people. And I look at that and I mean, I learned my work ethic because of my pop and my mom who were willing to sacrifice. But how do you then transfer into or not be impacted by a culture that says, Michael, it's all about you. Don't even worry. Like you got to fill up Michael before your wife. And, and a lot of the, the society, social media yeah. says, fill up Michael. And if your wife ain't coming along, then you yeah. just, maybe she ain't the right one. Yeah. How have you been able to navigate that? That is tough. If, if I could be even a fraction of what uh, as self-sacrificial as my parents were, then I, I would consider myself a su successful parent. Uh, my parents poured, like they, they literally gave their life um, for us. Like they came, you know, they, they, we, we came here. I mean, my parents didn't have a spare dollar in their, in their, in their pocket when they came I and mean, we came with just like a couple of bags of some clothes and we had a couple of churches that helped us um move into uh, a duplex was the first one 
And my dad would work two jobs and then he'd take night classes in school afterwards. And my mom, you know, she stayed home and took care of all of us kids. And so, um, yeah, I mean, they, they, they poured and poured and poured into us. And that was part of what my awakening was in the first place. When, when I was in that cubicle sitting at that job, it was like, thinking back, like my grandfather fought in World War II. He, he was, he fought for the Red Army. He got captured, spent four years in the Dachau concentration camp. My dad came over here with nothing like, I mean, we, you know, living on pennies, trying to, trying to survive, trying to feed the kids, put a roof over our heads. And now here I am sitting here with all the opportunities and I'm kind of squandering, squandering my life away. And so, it, because I was just thinking about myself, it's just like, well, I don't have the kind of struggle my parents had. Now it's about, you know, what, what, what makes me happy? But as you know, as we all know, it's like, it's in service of others that really we find the most meaning. It's when you're pouring into somebody else is what, is what, you know, it's, uh, that's our job. That's, that's our responsibility. And it's like, I think Jordan Peterson said it best. It's like, it's actually the more responsibility you take on, the more meaning your life is going to have. The more you try to just find pleasure for yourself, the more empty you're going to be. And so it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, I, I mean, to answer your question, I, I don't know the right answer for it, honestly. I just wish that I hope that I can even be a fraction of that and maybe translate that to my kids as well, that it's pouring into other people. That's what's actually going to make you happy at the end. It, yeah, today the culture totally got it backwards. I mean, it's yeah, it's all me, me, me. And if the person that I'm with is not not fulfilling that or not on the same thing, then they're the wrong person. There's no willingness to sacrifice. There's no willingness to, um, to compromise. And it's just, yeah, it's unfortunate. Well, I, I, I see it in this, this way, right? So most of the time, like we have both extremes. We have the, um, old school feel of fill everyone else's cup, right? Mm -hmm. Just fill it all. That's what our parents, yeah. then we have new age mm -hmm. today, fill your cup. And whatever flows over the top of it, that's what other people get. Hmm. But what God revealed to me was a different side and was, was one of which I, it blew my mind. He said, it's not about filling someone else's cup. It's not about filling up your cup. It's about cutting the bottom out of your cup. Because he hmm. asked me, he showed me a cup and it was, oh, it was eight ounces. And he said, how much water could fit in that cup? And I was like, that's easy, God, eight ounces. <laughs> He said, are you sure? I said, yes. He said, are you sure? And I know when there's a third question, when God is asking the third question, I know something's about to hit. He said, are you sure? So that was the third question. I was like, uh, kind of. He said, imagine if you cut the bottom out of the cup, the whole world of water could fit through the cup. Mm. And so... What he was telling me is I'll keep pouring it on if you keep pouring it out. But the only way that that can happen is by cutting the bottom out because now all the people that come around you get fresh water as opposed to the overflow. Hmm. Does that good. make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, when you, when you're thinking like, you know, when you're going through these kind of things, what are the, like, what are the struggles for you? I mean, you're, again, you're a thought leader, you're helping people. What are the things that Michael struggles with? living living up to the standard that i that i set for other people like uh you know following my own principles that i teach to other people and being being the kind of person that i'm trying to help other people be but actually living up to that myself you know you i, I don't care like what you do what you accomplish you're still always gonna have doubts you're still gonna because you you know you yourself better than anybody right and you know how you talk and what what kind of masks you put up in front of people and how you behave, but you, you know, your own thoughts and you know, your own heart. And so I would say personally, for me, the biggest thing is always trying to check myself and like, am I the person that I represent or like, am I actually the, the kind of person that I put, put myself out that I show myself to be and how do I continue to live up to that? Um, we, actually, uh, I had a, we were at like a men's conference. Uh, I think it was sometime uh, last summer. And uh, we had, we, you know, we kind of had some time between each other to kind of, you know, pray over each other, you know, kind of share some time individually. And there was a guy that uh, came up to me and he's like, hey, I feel like, you know, you're you're going to you're going to have a lot of eyes on you. You're going to have a lot of attention on you. Um, 
what are you going to do with it? Like, are you going to be able to carry that responsibility? Like, where are you going to lead people through that? And that was big for me. That was like heavy. Cause I was like, even at that time already, I'm like, I'm not the, in here, I'm not the kind of person that I pretend to be. And, you know, if, if we're going to speak, you know, if we're going to be speaking honestly. Um, and, and so for me, it was just like a big reminder that like, whatever you're preaching, whatever you're speaking, whatever you're putting out there, hold yourself up to that standard. Cause people are going to follow you. People are going to be inspired by you. People are going to listen. They're going to, they're going to put weight to what you say. And so there, there better be substance to it. It better not just be a facade. And, and so that was huge for me. So I'd say that's the biggest thing. When's the last time your wife called you on something in one of your books? And uh, so like maybe you're going through it, right? You're going through it, you're doing something. And she actually used a principle from like the Mount of Olives or from, uh, you know, cabin at the end of the train. And mm. she was like, Michael, here we go. Yeah. Um, Matt, no, no, the, I don't have anything specific. I think she's probably, she probably knows I wouldn't like that too much. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if I have anything specific. Uh, yeah, come on. Maybe, maybe, we need, more... maybe we need to bring her on. That's what, that's what I'm talking about. Like, you know, cause I, the reason why I say it is because my, my wife is real as the day is long. Like for those of uh, the, those people out there that know Brooklyn, um, Brooklyn is, is real. She, she will cut me real quick. She'll punch me in the throat uh, very fast. And she has the tendency to, and she doesn't do it in a nasty way, but when I have like, I need a piece of advice and I'm like th that, that little line in between your eyes gets really strong and I'm like squinting. And I'm like, baby, I've got this challenge. And then I'll come to her and she'll be like, okay, dummy. Like, why don't you do, why don't you do this? And she'll tell me and I'll be like, you know, and then I won't listen to her. Yeah. And then like two weeks later, I'll come back to her and I'll be like, yo, I got this great idea. And then I recite back to her what she said. And she doesn't even call me on it. She's like, yep. Great idea. <laughs> Great idea, baby. Has that happened to you? Uh, not that specifically, but she will call me out. She's very good at uh, pointing out because I'll, you know, I'm very quick to be like, hey, you know, you, you shouldn't, you know, don't do this or don't talk like this, you know, ch change your mindset. And then she'd be like, wait, well, what about this? The last thing, the last time you got ticked off, that was pretty much <laughs> exactly what I'm doing now. And so I'm like, dang, because I'm very vocal. I start talking like I got veins popping out of my neck and I'm like, I know what I'm talking about. You know, I know everything. And then it's just like, oh, shoot. Yeah, I'm not living up to that same standard. <laughs> and yeah, so that's big. How, how does it translate in marriage? Right. Because when you have principles like say, um, you know, there's a couple of things that I'll, I'll, I just spoke on this weekend about, about vibe, right? And so, like, they bring me in um, to create the vibe in the in the conference because, like, it's simple for me, which is I make conferences cool. And mm. so they brought me in for the vibe, and the vibe for me is very simple. It's, it's understanding your heart set, which is your beliefs, understanding your mindset, which is your intentions, and then that develops your skill set, right? Mm. So my, my heart set is I'm awesome, I'm beautiful, I can do anything that I put my mind to. And my pop summed it up like this, you're the greatest, so act accordingly, boy. My mindset is to simply be kind, make a ton of friends, and stay really curious. And my skill set is straight relentless. Like, it's, I mean, so it, that part makes it an irresistible vibe that mm -hmm. no matter what I'm selling, no matter what I'm doing, people want to be a part of. And so I bring that in, right? And I'm like, heart set, mindset, skill set. Like I'm like, yeah, the audience is going loud. <sighs> yeah. And then I get home and my wife says something. And I'm like, look, you need to check your heart set. And she's like, don't try that stuff on me, boy. And like, do you get called on that kind of stuff when you try and systemize your wife and personally develop your wife? I would say so. Yeah, I'd say it's pretty similar to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get into my I get into my speaker voice at home a little a little too much and she'll call me out very quick on that. Yeah. <laughs> what, I, what yeah you... Sometimes I want to be like, wait, did you not hear my last speech? And I'm <laughs> I, I, I'm smarter I'm smarter than that. So <laughs> I usually don't. <laughs> how how do you adapt to an audience? This is probably one of the biggest things because I have yeah. seen speak. Now you're a phenomenal speaker, and I in watching your stuff, it seems like you adapt to the audience as opposed to have a canned thing that you're going to say. Like you're able to move with the energy. But I have seen people that literally have they know exactly what they're going to say when they walk in. They say it, and they don't care what the audience feels or moves or anything like that. And mm -hmm. when you see like the, the, the goats, right? When you see like the Dave Chappelle's or the, yeah. the, the Kevin Hart's, you can see that they move it 
they feel the audience and they, I mean, although there's rehearsed things, they're yeah. able to move it. How do you do that? A big thing that's helped me is I, I'll either jump on a call with event planners and my, I'll, I'll ask them a couple of questions like, hey, what are in this last year, what are some of the biggest things that these people like specifically? Not just like, oh, we have burnout, but like, was there some, was there a lot of people that were let go or is there a lot of changes? Um, what, what's like the one big thing that's on a lot of people's minds right now? I spoke at a company recently where they, the, the main CEO was stepping away. I mean, he was still going to be like somehow involved. And so that was, it brought a lot of fear to it. So then what I do is like, I do have prepackaged, you know, principles and things that I'm going to speak about, share stories, but I kind of lean them towards that, you know, because now we're talking about uncertainty. Now we're talking about, well, if the rug is pulled out from under you, you know, how do you adapt to that? How do you change? And there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There, you know, that means that there's just an opportunity to grow, an opportunity for your life to take a different direction. And it's always going to be in a good, in a good way because any kind of shake up in life, you know, always, it might not feel like it at the time, but it always ends up, you know, to be a good thing if you really look at it and if you have that growth mindset. Um, but yeah, I, I try to learn as much as possible about the audience. And then I start sharing stories or I'm kind of speaking to the problems and they're like nodding as if, you know, like I know them personally. And it's just, it's just a little bit of extra background work. And then of course I just feed off the, then once, once I start speaking, I feed off their energy. Meaning like if I, if I, I kind of, I'll have some like sarcastic, you know, I kind of, I don't make jokes from, from the audience, but like I do I have kind of like some sarcastic little snarky remarks. And if they really laugh at that, if they really enjoy that, then I'll kind of lean into that and go off that a little bit more. It makes them more uh, relaxed environment. Um, but yeah, I kind of, I, and I'm getting better at that because I, when I was just starting out, I mean, I knew what I was going to say, and just like you were talking about. And that was it. I was so worried about myself and not looking like an idiot and not messing up that I didn't care what the audience was doing. I was just like, I got to say it and I got to say it right in the way in the, in the way that I planned on saying it. Um, but as I got better and more comfortable, then I was able to kind of start feeding off the audience a little bit as well. So going into a new industry, right? Uh, you and your, you know, you stepped off into it and then your wife, you know, she, she stepped in and you guys worked together. You come into a completely new thing that, I mean, you were in an office job and then you jump into the personal development. Talk to us about some of the top lessons that you guys learned um, mm. when you were developing the business and how you actually learned to be able to develop in the business in the first place. Um, the, the number, the number one thing I learned, so like a little backstory, I, uh, I was terrified of public speaking. Like I, in my, my first semester in college, I, uh, had to take a public speaking class. It was supposed to be a three minute speech. I, I shared this story often. Um, I walked up there, my mind just went blank. I mean, I, I, I was saying something. I don't remember what I was saying in middle of my speech. I just walked out, I grabbed my backpack and I left the class and I came back the next day. I told the counselor, like, I'm never stepping on a stage again. Like never, I'm never doing that again. So I had a big fear, um, a lot of insecurities to overcome. The biggest thing I learned was I actually went, when I was getting into the speaking thing, I went to train with somebody, you might know him, Bo Eason. So he used to play for the Oilers. Yeah. I know you're a big Oilers fan. Yeah. yeah. Do you know who Bo Eason is? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I went and trained with him because now he's, he trains speakers. And one of the biggest things, like the, I still have it written up on my whiteboard. I still talk about it. It's like, no one's going to choose you, choose yourself. And to me, that was like, you're not an ex athlete. You're not some Navy SEAL. Like you, you obviously have this thing stacked up against you. As far as if we're talking about motivational speakers, you have a lot against you. You know, you're at the bottom of the, of, of the pile, but he said like, no, no one's going to choose you. You got to choose yourself. And that means instead of sitting there waiting for the phone to ring, okay, how do I start reaching out to event planners? What can I do with, you know, what kind of website can I build? What can I, how can I position myself? How can I market myself to still establish myself as, you know, an, an expert or, you know, a thought leader in, in this and not worry about what everyone else is doing and everyone else's accomplishments, but what do I have to offer and how do I dig that out of me and, and present that? So that was like one of the best things that I learned. It was like, choose yourself. And for me, that mindset was everything. I, to this day, I'm like, the minute I started catching myself complaining a little bit or it's not happening fast enough or I'm not to the level I want to be yet, it's just like, hey, then choose yourself. Then what do you need to do to, to move forward? Because no one's going to call you. No one's going to come and give you success. No one's going to come and make this happen for you. Like, what do you need to do to make the right connection, to make the right phone call, the right email, 
the right business move to to kind of set you up and move you in the right direction. So it was huge. What is the biggest advantage of not growing up in this country? Like being born in another country, especially in the Ukraine, and going through some of the things that you went through, which can be embarrassing, right? Probably, you know, you got a little bit of a hard time as far as your your uh, your accent, probably at first. Um, you you said that your growth spurt didn't happen until later, so you were five. <laughs> you were five three. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah. talk about some of the advantages of the disadvantages that you had growing up? Man, the, as far as advantages, it's just my perspective. It's, it's, it's all about perspective. Like seeing how hard my parents were working, like it, it's funny. My dad always makes, makes fun of me. He always says this story. He's, I don't remember it, but he's like, when you were a kid, you came up, I came home from work one day and you had like a little penny in your, in your palm. And you're like, here, dad, here's, here's penny for the mortgage. You know, I said it to him in Russian, but he's, he always, he's kind of, he always laughs and he mimics what I was saying, but I was telling him, I'm like, dad, you're laughing, but I'm like, I'm pretty sure the reason I did that was because you guys were always talking about, you know, if dad doesn't go to work, cause we would complain like dad, take a swimming, take us, you know, and dad's like, if, if I don't go to work, we can't pay the bills. We're not going to have a house. So as a kid, I'm like, well, if I don't help my dad make the money, then we're going to lose the house. <laughs> wow. So I'm just, you know, I'm, it, it was just that kind of a mindset. Um, so I was terrified, but I, it's, it was, it was just, it's perspective. When, when I, the minute I find myself complaining, um, I, I complain enough and I'm trying to stop completely, but I hate complainers, even though I'm one of them, because it's like everything in life is perspective. Like you were sharing, you know, today you said, like, you all have your problems, you all have your prayers. And then the minute someone comes in and they have something real that they're dealing with, you're like, oh, shoot. <laughs> you know, like uh, somebody said it recently, the best way it was like, if we all threw our problems out in the air, we'd all ask for our problems back, you know, because we'd see what everyone else is dealing with. And we'd, we'd rather just take ours back and be like, you know what, I, I can handle it now because I see what everyone else is dealing with. Um, as far as like, yeah, work ethic, the, the, just watching how hard my parents worked and how they struggled to, to feed at that point. I think we had 11 kids. Um, it was just, to me, it's just like anytime I see someone complaining about the little job that they're in, you know, it's just like, I don't know what you like. You, how can you possibly succeed if you're complaining where you're at right now and you have everything given to you? So I just always try to remind myself that, hey, it's just like my parents went through so much more. My grandparents went through so much more. I have all these opportunities. So it's just like I better put some urgency to it and do everything that I possibly can. Take the opportunities that I view as talents in many of aspects of my life. I view myself as the servant who received five talents, even though you could look at our life growing up, it, we could be like the servant with one talent. Like we got the least, we, we, we started, you know, we're immigrants. My parents didn't know the language. We had all this stuff stacked against us, but we also had good loving parents and two of them, which so many people don't have. We had a support system between my brothers and sisters. And so it's like, I, I was like, I'm, I'm going to choose to look at my life as a person who got five talents. I got all this going for me. So I have no excuse to not do something bigger with it, not just to collect money for myself or to succeed and achieve my personal goals, but to use this incubator that we have of love and support and pour into other people and do something bigger with it. Did you say there was 11 kids? 13 kids, 11 kids at the time. <laughs> 13, so, you have 13, 13 have, kids. Yeah, in your I have, I have eight brothers and five sisters. Yeah. Where are you at in this? Six. I'm like right in the middle. You're right in the middle. So Six, did you, yeah. did, I mean, did your parents even know your names? Could, yeah, they did. Yeah. Did they Birthday call you? <laughs> did they call you? Did they call you by other names though? No, I, think my, I would say my parents were pretty good with it. Did they name them all with M's or something like that? No, it's all random. Olga, Eli, Andre, Julie, Igor, Michael, Paul, Tim, Dennis, Eric, Lizzie, Nelly, Leah. So. Good Lord. <laughs> all Thir over the place. 13 kids. 13 so kids. That, I, don't know what, I don't know what my parents were thinking, um, but I, around that time. I know like, what they were thinking. I know what yeah, they were yeah. thinking. You're, you're, I know they what your pop was thinking. <laughs> they yeah, they weren't doing too much thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So my, my pops used to always say, uh, you know, I want to do this, this segment. I don't do it all the time, but I get to do it occasionally. But my pops would talk about running with the mufflers off, meaning that if there was no judgment and you didn't have to be politically correct, you didn't have to do any of those things. You just got to run with the mufflers off. What would be that advice 
Um, or what would you say to a person that grew up in America, stayed in America the whole time, has never been outside, and is complaining about their situation? I want to give you a little bit of context, too. The reason why I wanted to do this run, run with Muffles with you is because my Uber driver uh, the other day, I said, hey, man, thank you so much for picking me up, whatever it is. We started to talk, and I said, where are you from? He said, well, I've lived here for you know, 10 years. I said, okay, cool. Where are you from? Because his accent was strong. And I knew, but I wanted to see if he would tell me. And he was like, I'm from Iraq. And we started talking about Iraq. And I said, why'd you move here? He said, because I worked on a military base working with the Americans, but my cousin was too. And they found out, they followed my cousin and shot him dead at his home four times. He told me where they shot him, in the head, oh. in, the, in the heart, and then in the back twice. And he said they did that because we were working, working. with the American military. And I'm thinking in my head, I have no idea what this even feels like. And then I started to ask him questions, and he started to take me through. He said, I then had to stop working with them. We had to go into hiding. We had to do all these things. I became a refugee. I came over to this country. And he was like, I love everything. He said, like, and he was just like, you know, he was on fire. And then I asked him about, like, you know, what is your perspective on these kind of things? And he's like, man, people talk about wanting more and more and more. And he said, seriously, the fact that I get to wake up, see this sunset, I'm good. And so he was giving unfiltered, un, he, he was running with the mufflers off. If you were able to run with the mufflers off from a person or speaking to a crowd of people who have, grown up in America who are complaining about their job right now or complaining about their situation, what would you say? I'll take you in a little bit. As far as like the last couple of years, like politically, there's been so much complaining, even just that, not even just necessarily with people's personal income or dreams or, you know, lack of accomplishments, but even politically, it's just like, everyone's like found community and complaining, you know, it's just like, Oh, here's how this current president screwed up. Here's how the last one screwed up. Here's how, and it's just like this constant thing. And I'm like, actually, you know, what the Uber driver said is a lot of what I've been talking about. I'm like, man, guys, don't forget that right now, as you know, you and I, we wake up, we have our wives, we have, we're hanging out with our nieces in our backyard. We're doing a fire. Like there's Russian and Ukrainian kids slaughtering each other to death right now. Like 18 year old kids that have dreams that have, that could be potential physicists or engineers or whatever that, but they're getting, they're laying, they're waking up in trenches right now, like literally right now, you know, during the, the war. So it's just like, you know, three, three weeks ago now, one of my best, one of my best friends lost his wife. Uh, I was one of their, one of the groomsmen in, in his wedding. And it's just like, when you start to count it up, it's just like the fact that you have the, the, <laughs> excuse me, you know, the fact that you have the balls to complain, is just like, you're, it just means you're not stopping and counting the blessings that you have, or if you don't want to count the blessings, count what what kind of things that you could that you could have stacked against you that people are dealing with right now as we speak. And if you even take two minutes to think about it, like you you would stop and you would get on your knees and you thank God that you woke up today and you have one more day to breathe and you're not packing up and you're not marching off, you know, leaving your wife at home to go fight like so. You know, please don't complain around, at least not around me. Um, that's the way I've, that's kind of the mindset I've had over, especially over the last couple, I guess, last couple of years, actually. When we go through traumatizing things, right? So, uh, 2021, my pop, uh, went on to heaven. Now he wasn't mad at, at it. Cause he got to go spend time with my mom and hang out with Jesus. But I was sad because I was like, pop, you're, you're leaving. Like, you know, don't leave, man. Come back. When I had that, like, I remember the day he passed and it was almost like the things that he told me throughout my life, son, be here, be present, slow down, think about what really matters. Does this really matter that you get this promotion or that you make this money or you make this deal? It doesn't, son. What matters is spend a time with your son, loving on your daughter, spend a time with your wife. And I heard it throughout my life, but I was like, yeah, yeah. But then once that hit and my pop went, mm. I was like, man. Yeah. But then we, then we slip back into regular reality. 
Michael, how can a person stay in that present gratefulness that you speak on and that you help people to be able to grab a hold of? How do we keep that potent when there's not a catastrophe that's happened in their life recently? Hmm. It has to, you have to set up, you have to set yourself up for success. Meaning like there has to be little, little things, little strategies, little things that you put, you, you create little habits that you create around your life to do that. Like you five, 10 minutes in the morning, you get up and you don't just brush your teeth and shoot off to work. Like you, you, you have to give yourself time to sit, whether it's in silence or you're reading or you're praying or you take a walk. You have to give yourself like these little spaces of time in life to stop and reflect, to stop and think. Like when I was really going through my kind of personal development journey, like I knew I want to change. I knew I wanted something different. I would set little alarms on my phone. So my phone, my alarm would go off, you know, three, four times throughout the day. And it just said, you know, stop and pray or speak life, whatever. And it was just like, it was a reminder for me to stop, to pay attention to what I'm saying. What was that negative dialogue? What's going on up here? And how do I change that? And or it was, you know, gratitude, you know, it's quickly stop. Hey, what are some things going on in my life right now that like, that I'm just like, really, I'm losing perspective, because I'm just so caught up in this crap or this problem that I'm dealing with right now. And it just, it, it developed. And now I don't have to do it anymore, because it's just a part of what I do. Um, but when I was really needing that change and shift in mindset, I had to like, specifically, very carefully plan these little moments in my life, or I would take a Sharpie and I would write little notes on my wrist. So anytime I reach for something, you know, I'd see it on my wrist and it'd be a reminder again, but very strategically and, and intentionally doing that kind of develop this perspective in me. And I can still slip out of it. I still find myself in moments where I start slipping away. I'm like, okay, shoot. What were some of those things that I did? I got to bring some of those tools back because, you know, I'm kind of slipping out of that and I'm kind of losing perspective a little bit. Um, but yeah, finding little things, that little, like I said, either setting some time in the morning or in the evening or both setting some alarms, just intentionally finding ways to keep that perspective. It's not going to come easy, but once you've kind of established a couple of habits in that, then they're going to be working for you instead of against you. So in the personal development realm, what I've noticed too, is a lot of times the rituals become the religion. And I'm not speaking of religion, whether it be Jewish or Catholic or, you know, uh, Seventh-day Adventist or whatever it is. I'm talking a lot of times the getting up at 4.30 in the morning, the journaling or the writing, that becomes the thing that the people start to worship as opposed to the reason why they're doing it. How do you help people to not turn those rituals, which are amazing things to do, into the yeah. thing that they actually worship as opposed to the reason why they're doing them in the first place. Oh, that's good. I, I challenge people. I've been challenging myself of this lately and I, and I challenge people to do the same thing is like, it's like when you, whatever your brain gets used to, like it'll get it like habits are incredible, but also at the same time habits that like you, it can become noise. It can just become, like you said, it's just a ritual, it's just something you do and you don't even, you're not intentional about it. So like, Personally, for me lately, I've been trying to find unique conversations or doing something that that's uncomfortable. Like, you know, like I'm just sitting on a plane. I don't want to talk to anyone. I want to get on my flight, fly. But I'm like, no, you know what? Just ask this person, you know, where they're flying or what's going on in their life. And it's just like putting yourselves in these little uncomfortable environments and these little moments. It like it takes you out. It, 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 first of all, it gives you perspective right away. Um, but second of all, it, it's kind of like that little, uh, those little jolts of electricity that like wake you back up again. And then you remember like, yeah, that's why I wake up and I journal in the morning. That's why, you know, I got some of these things in place because at any given moment I'm talking to somebody and somebody's dealing with something. Um, so yeah, I would challenge people to find, even if it's one thing a week, just be, to be uncomfortable. Whether you go up and talk to somebody or you, um, I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't know, you know, can't think of any specifics, but just find something that kind of gives you that jolt, that, that little reminder that's beyond just what your daily little schedule or, or habits you've created for yourself. So one of the things that my, my mom did is she was, she would always direct my eyes to the Lord. And this was my pop too, mm -hmm. but my mom was, was massive with it. 
And she was like, you know, check it with the word, check it with the word, check it with the word. And I was always like, man. And I, I just have this big book in front of me, this Bible in front of me. I'd be like, where do I start? And then my mom was like, well, you should start in John. It's very easily consumable. Read John and then move on from there. And, and she told me a couple books. When we look at Michael's library, right, of your books, where should a person start? It's a good question. If we're talking, I mean, my, my first, the first thing that comes to mind is always, I don't know, start with Proverbs, something like that. Okay. Start with well, no, I'm talking about, well, but what about Michael's books? Like the ones that you've okay. authored. Okay. Like oh, okay. To, okay. to understand, okay. to understand, and then we'll go into that one because I want to go, go keep that yeah, mindset. Yeah. But Michael's library, Mount of Olives, train traveler where are we mm -hmm. where do we go uh, i would start with mount of olives that was probably the more um uh, more uh the most where through the story i was kind of like maybe the most vulnerable where i shared you know through this boy's journey like insecurities and i tried to be as um i try to cover as much as possible as far as like you know, real, real things that one that I struggle with and just, you know, brutally honest, but that I feel like a lot of people uh, struggle with as well. So I feel like that, that probably the, the best one because it's just raw, it's open. Um, and it's a very emotional book. Um, and it was, for me, it was very therapeutic to write it. It's, and for, I think for that reason that, that can, especially if somebody has been kind of hardened to life, hardened by failure, hardened by rejection, um, I feel like that would be a good book that could soften soften you up and maybe crack crack you open a little bit. What's number two? Number two, I'd say the cabin at the end of the train. Okay. The cabin, yeah, yeah, because that one I actually write. It's a it's a fiction book, but it has more. I'm actually writing it as myself, so I'm writing a big part of my story, but in a in a in a fictional story. Where do so, we, yeah. where do we go three? Three, uh, the traveler's secret, and then the servant with one talent. Servant with one talent. Um, I love the story is based on the parable of the talents. So what I do is I kind of added a, re uh, a redemption story to the, the parable of the talents. So when, when the, you know, the, the servant with one talent presents basically no, no investment, he just brings the gold back, you know, biblically it's, you know, he's, you know, thrown into where there's, you know, weeping and gnashing of teeth. And my story is basically he gets cast out of Babylon and which according to Babylon rule, in those days, it's like if you owed somebody money, they could legally basically kick you out of the city. They you were like their property and you could get kicked out and you live with the lepers and the and the, you know, so um, that was a really fun story to write, but just a little bit more practical. Um, but yeah, I would say that was before. Well, let's go back to you. You were talking about Proverbs. How do you get the word to come alive? <sighs> I, it has to be immediately applied. Like it has to be immediately applied and you can, you can get, when I teach, when I talk about my action principle in my speeches, I always talk, I share a story of when my brothers and I got in an accident, we got into a little bit of a road rage. This lady ran us off the road. Like we went rolling down the freeway. I was unbuckled, rolled over several times. We landed on a roof, skid, all of us crawled out. Like it was a miracle. I was unbuckled in the backseat, like flying around the car. And I, uh, the, I share that story and I always share, the fact that I had major like clarity in my life. There's, you know, something called mortality motivation where it's just like, you have that spark, you have a jolt, you have maybe some bad news from a doctor. And it's like, you have this moment of awakening. Like now you see what's important to you and what you've been wasting your time on. Like you see, like you have that clarity, but if there's nothing done, it doesn't matter how much clarity you've had. It doesn't matter how big of a wake up call you've had over time that fades away. Motivation fades away. Like emotions fade away. So there has to be a commitment to, implementation like uh, like there has to be a commitment to the process whether you're working on a dream or it's reading something like proverbs like, it's like okay that was a powerful that was a deep like let me meditate on that for a little bit before i move on and how do i apply that into my life what's one way i can immediately incorporate that into my life whether um whether it's the way i carry myself whether it's something i physically do but i think application is everything we we uh I grew up, I started for like 10 years of my life. We were in a very, very, like almost a cultic kind of a, a church that we used to go to. Like, it, it was like really bad if we're talking about religion. And so I had a very bad view of the Bible. Like every, it was just a rule book of do's and don'ts and mostly don'ts. And I never measured up to it because none of us can. And so it to me, it was just like this distant, God was this distant, 
Punisher and that was it. And so for me, like even now as a grown man reading, you know, like there's still like some of that old gunk that I have to remove the old beliefs because I'm like, I'm still reading this from a, I'm guilty. I'm not enough. I'm not good enough kind of mindset. And the, and so now like rereading everything, I'm like Proverbs, there's just so much practical, even if you're not a person of faith, you can read. And there's so much gold, like as a leader of a company, like there's so much stuff in there that it can, that can be applied. And so now I'm like, now I'm reading it through that perspective. And it's just like, okay, this is Apple. This is actually hitting me where I need it because I can see it in my life. I can see the fruits of it in my life. And that's, that's powerful. Where do we know, or how do we know when we should end and God should begin? Because and context to this question is there's a lot of times that people will take one little thing from the word. They'll take one little proverb and they'll, twist it just a little bit, and then they'll put all the focus on them. You have managed masterfully to not do that and to do to, to push people's eyes towards where it actually needs to be. Hmm. But how do we know when we're supposed to end and God's supposed to begin? I think a, a constant evaluation of the heart, I guess I would say, like, constantly checking checking on yourself and and checking your own ego and 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 i would say turning to god and it's just like hey in areas of my life that i don't see my shortcomings like point it out to me sometimes it's through my wife <laughs> sometimes it's through friends but always point it out to me because it's very easy to start thinking i'm wise i know everything i and then that's right when you you know get called out on some of the most embarrassing stuff. And so, um, I, yeah, I, th I think that's, you, you gotta, like you're saying, where, where do you end and where God begins? I think it should be, um, almost a daily practice, not almost, it should be a daily practice, like constantly asking, like, Hey, revealing me all the crap, all those little hidden little, little thoughts and beliefs that I have about myself and my ego's growing again. You know, I know you can humble me, uh, I'd rather not wait till you humble me because then that's really going to hurt. So how do I continue to humble myself every day and, and, you know, call out in me things that, um, believes things with the way I carry myself, um, before, you know, before it take, before it goes too far. I don't know if that's, if, if that's, that is. That, that I would have said it, yeah, but yeah. That's amazing, man. So if, if, if we found out that Michael expires, after he gives this answer to the question I'm about to ask you. And this, the, your whole legacy, family, friends, everyone that you've come in contact with you is going to, is going to be the only thing that they remember is going to be the only thing that, that comes up. What yeah. is that advice that you're going to give? Oh man. Got it several things running through my head. Um, you're saying the last thing that people, that I, the last thing that I would say that people would ever know about me or that people would remember. And they would erase every single thing that you did. They're only going to know this one thing. They're going to know this one thing that you're going to give to them. How would you sum that up? Hmm. The, I would say the gift, the, the life is a gift. It's, you have a finite amount of time. It was granted to you a certain amount of time. Do everything that you possibly can with it because it's only a matter of time until you're going to have to return on that investment. And the way you carry yourself, the way you treat people, what you do with your gifts, skills, and talents and abilities, you're, you're one day going to answer for it. Um, and go after it with everything that you have. Go through your fears. Go through the obstacles that you're facing. Um, you know, whatever it is, the failures that you've had in the past, things that people have said to you that have beat you down be willing to fight those have the courage to fight those because at the end of the day that's the only thing that's going to matter is you're going to look back you're going to realize it was just a, it was a short trip and it was a gift and that's the only thing that's going to matter so forget about what everyone says forget about the failures that you've had in the past um go do what you feel like you were called to do michael you have been an awesome man i started the podcast because of my kids and um Maddox is 11, about to be 12 next week, and McKenna is 14. Maddox is a football player, sports guy, um, mm. life of the party, and just 
marches the beat of his own drum. McKenna, she's an actress, got a huge heart, incredible, incredible personality, sarcastic little personality, but the most love in her heart. I started the podcast because I didn't want them to worship idols. I wanted them to be inspired by icons like you. So what advice would you have for Maddox and McKenna? And if you could use both their names, it would be awesome. Yeah. Maddox and McKenna, uh, wherever you find yourselves, whether it's in sports, it's in acting, whether things change for you in the future, you know, afterwards, wherever you're at, remember that you are leaders. And the most important thing for a leader to be is to be themselves. No matter what everyone else, what the culture around you is like, the people that are going to be admired are the people that stand on their convictions, that stay true to themselves, that stay true to their beliefs. Um, those are the people that are always going to rise to the top, uh, despite what the culture around them is. So wherever you're at, and I know that you're both going to succeed in these things that you're pursuing, um, just make sure that you always stay true to yourself and, and continue to be yourself and people uh, are always going to follow you. Michael Ivanov, you have been phenomenal, man. If you're listening out there, you need to check this guy out on Instagram, on LinkedIn. Every single place you're going to see his handsome mug up there. Um, <laughs> make make sure, honestly, like do yourself the favor. Um, he gave the order of the books. It was Mount, like Mount of Olives. Then we go train. Then we go traveler. And then we end with talents. Am I correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, so that's not the order they were written in, but that's the order. Uh, that's what he would suggest. Yeah. Is he's the author, so we we need to listen to the man. But <laughs> check out his uh, check out his website to uh, speaklife three sixty dot com, uh, which I think is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and also too. For those of you out there listening or watching, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe because then my son thinks I'm cooler because I have more subs. <laughs> But for those of you who have been rocking with the podcast and you want to be in the midst of someone great like this, like, like Michael, we have the Vibe Room. And the Vibe Room is the live podcast. It is probably one of the coolest projects. Now, the podcast is the coolest project I've ever done in my entire life. But we did the Vibe Room because everyone is asking, could I meet Michael? Could I see this live? Could I be in the audience to be able to hear Michael? Yes, you can. And October 5th, Salt Lake City, we're, we have, uh, we're, we're at the Edison House there, and we're going to have Larry Namer, the founder of the E! Entertainment Network. We've got Thurl Bailey, the voice of the Utah Jazz, and award-winning singer-songwriter, Mr. Damian Horn, uh, that is going to be playing music there, too. It is going to be, a, and we're going to have Olympic athletes that are going to be there. Um, it is going to be absolutely phenomenal. So that's the vibe room. Check that out and uh, you know, in the future. And hopefully in the future, I'll be able to get Michael to come out and be a, a, a guest in the vibe room itself. Um, but Michael, it has been my honor, my pleasure. Um, but it's not going to be the only time, man. I want to have you back on the podcast because I, I believe we're just scratching the surface of your wisdom. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree, Kelly. It's been an absolute honor. It's, it's been an incredible conversation. I love it. Well, you, you are, are way better than advertised, man. It is incredible. Can you do me a favor? Can you give a shout out to Rob and to Dave? Uh, Cause it would mean the world to them too. Rob, Dave, love you guys. Thank you guys so much for the for the connection. I appreciate all the support, uh, reading all my books, posting about it. It's um, it's truly an absolute honor for me. Thank you. Well, you have been, you, like I said, you've been incredible to all our sponsors. I want to uh, thank you guys. Uh, Jim DiGiulio of Finley Volvo Cars of Las Vegas. Chris Nagel, you know who you are. And Poppington's, because if you ain't eating Poppington's, it's just nothing but popcorn. So, uh, Michael, thank you so much. And you are officially off the hot seat. Thanks.